Some time ago, we investigated the adorable games that, once you dig a little deeper, turn out to be secret, terrifying nightmare dystopias. Horrifying, but at least we consoled ourselves. There were only seven games that were afflicted with this curse, and all other cute games really were just sweet and nice and normal. Or so we thought. Because you lot, the commenters, piped up with many, many more examples of adorable games that are in fact set in dark and terrifying twisted realities. At least if you really overthink it. Which is what we're all about! So here are your suggestions for cute games that were secretly terrifying nightmare dystopias. But we're spoilers for the following. It's hard to think of anything cuter than Kirby, and if that thing did exist, Kirby could simply eat it and become as cute as it, just like Timothy Chalamet did to Tom Holland. After all, Kirby is just a squishy pink blob who spends most of his time floating around a colourful cartoon world, solving cute platforming puzzles, inhaling baddies to use their powers, and choreographing pretty elaborate dance sequences for someone with so few knees. So the idea that the Kirby universe is secretly terrifying is frankly laughable, and it's with that attitude that I'm going to read this comment from the comment alien, who writes, Kirby, in that universe the entirety of Earth is frozen over from some sort of nuclear winter. Oh. Specifically, we direct your attention to Kirby 64 The Crystal Shards, a game that begins with Kirby trying to help the fairies of Ripplestar retrieve the shards of a sacred crystal, an extremely cutesy plot that in no way prepares you for the fact that level 5, Shiverstar, is very plainly a frozen version of our own Earth, moon and all. I say again, oh. Now, perhaps you're thinking, as you scramble to make sense of this horrifying revelation, that this is simply Earth as seen during the most recent Ice Age, around 2.6 million years ago. But unfortunately, the truth cannot be denied, because later in the level, what should Kirby come across but an abandoned department store, confirming that Shiverstar is indeed Earth post-human civilization. Research suggests that human-made climate change will suppress the next Ice Age, leaving nuclear winter as the only sane explanation for the images you're currently seeing. There is some good news, however, as a translated version of this old Nintendo website suggests the inhabitants of Shiverstar, i.e. us, left the planet rather than being vaporised in a nuclear apocalypse. So, you know, swings and roundabouts. Are two things destroyed along with the rest of human civilization. The Legend of Zelda Wind Waker is easily the most adorable Zelda game, as cute and hilarious as a farting piglet. Which is also in the game! In this cel-shaded adventure, which at the time was a huge artistic departure from previous Zelda games, you control a massive-eyed Link in a quirky quest across the ocean, full of whimsical pirates and grumpy dragons! Just how cute is the Wind Waker, you ask? In this game, even Tingle is reasonably unthreatening. And that is really saying something, you guys. In fact, though, Wind Waker is so cute you could easily miss that it's set in a world ravaged by disaster, as commenter James Chambly capably points out. Legend of Zelda Wind Waker. Its cutesy art style makes you forget that the opening cinematic says that the Hero of Time never returned to Hyrule to save it from Ganon, so the gods just flooded everything. James Chambly is right. The very beginning of the game recalls a legend about a time that Ganon, the recurring evil force that periodically shows up to wreck up Hyrule, well, uh, showed up to wreck up Hyrule. Only this time, Link didn't show up to save the day, perhaps because he forgot to set his alarm the night before. As such, faced with Ganon's fiery onslaught, the people of Hyrule turned to the gods for help, who, in their godly wisdom, used their powers to slay Ganon. Just kidding, they flooded the entire world, killing almost everyone! 
everyone that is, except, as Link later learns, a select few chosen by the gods to repopulate a new kingdom. Those lucky individuals who were told to head for high ground before the rains came. Between Ganon and the gods' weather tantrum, it's fair to assume that almost the entire population of Hyrule was wiped out in this calamity, leaving the few survivors to eke out a living in what little landmass was left. Evidently, there wasn't room for everyone though. The very few Gorons Link meets in Wind Waker reveal that they have had to come from very far away and now scratch a living as travelling merchants. Okay, this is getting a little bit too grim. Can we see the farting piglet again? I feel a bit better. But only a bit. Disney isn't afraid of getting dark, whether it's wicked stepmothers, haunted mansions, or slowly monopolising the entire entertainment industry. But cross the adorable worlds of Disney with monster-filled Final Fantasy, and you get Kingdom Hearts, a series that looks absurdly adorable on the surface, but in fact is so obsessed with darkness that if you got a penny for every time they mentioned it, you'd have more cash than, well, the cryogenically frozen head of Walt Disney. Darkness. The true darkness! This didn't go unnoticed by Oversoul Gaming, who said, Kingdom Hearts definitely fits this list. Majority of the franchise takes place after the Great Keyblade War, which saw thousands of children dying and the entire world was split into multiple different worlds. You may also notice that the populations of every world in the early games are scarce. Indeed, Kingdom Hearts sees you running through lots of wonderful Disney worlds, reliving classic adventures with everyone's favorite Disney heroes. And also Donald and Goofy are there. But look past the bright colours and you'll soon see that all of the worlds have gone from storybook lands to pure nightmare fuel, having become overrun with the malevolent creatures known as the Heartless. And the worlds in the older games are indeed scarcely populated, to which you might say, well, consoles at the time couldn't handle many characters on screen at once, I'm sure it doesn't mean anything more. But we say, yeah, you keep telling yourself that. They're all dead. And dig a little deeper and you'll find that there was indeed a devastating war, and that thousands of Keyblade-wielding children, just like wide-eyed and wide-shoed hero Sora, perished on a battlefield. Maybe because they were trying to defend themselves with their house keys? On the plus side, this cataclysmic event is in fact why you can visit all these wonderful Disney worlds and meet your favourite Disney characters. Yeah, I don't know about you, but I'd rather just queue for a bit at Disneyland. 70 minutes for Mr. Toad's wild ride! This is bull****! Poetry gets a bad rap, perhaps because it so often sounds like bad rap. But the pursuit of written verse has its charms, not least for you, the protagonist of the sugary sweet Doki Doki Literature Club. At the start of the game you find yourself signed up for a school writing society at the behest of your neighbour Sayori, who doesn't want you wasting your life on games and anime. Turns out the literature club is full of, in the protagonist's words, cute girls. But perhaps that's not altogether surprising, seeing as you're playing what is clearly a dating simulator, right? Wrong! As many, many of you pointed out, Doki Doki Literature Club is a perfect example of a cute game that's secretly a nightmare. Ify Dreamer knows the score. Isn't it obvious? Doki Doki Literature Club! Oh, come on now, Ify. Doki Doki isn't so bad. Unless, of course, you count the game unravelling before your eyes into a deeply disturbing, jump scare fueled glitch fest. Then discovering that club president Monica knows she's trapped in a game, a hellish dating dystopia no less, and has been systematically killing off the other characters by deleting their code. But apart from that, perfectly cheerful. I don't know what all the fuss is about. Now if you'll excuse me, I need a lie down. <laughs> Oh. Oh. 
conventional wisdom would have it that canines and robots don't mix. So if someone could inform Boston Dynamics before their robot dogs stamp us all to death and take over Earth, that would be appreciated. One place they very much do mix, however, is in Nintendo DS game Solato Robo, which tells the story of an anthropomorphic dog mercenary called Red, who pilots a mech and goes on cool treasure hunting adventures in a world of floating islands inhabited by the Kaininu and Filinico. <laughs> Or if you prefer, and I do, dogs and cats. Although it was critically well received, not a lot of folks remember Salata Robo, possibly because of how hard it is to pronounce. But commenter Jathic Tylius does and says, I remember a game called Salata Robo. It's set in a world of colourful floating islands in the sky, inhabited by cute dog and cat people. Sounds nice, I wonder why it's on this list. Oh wait, there's more. It also turns out the world was originally Earth, where humans began fighting for a scarcity of resources and destroyed their civilization in war and made the surface uninhabitable. Yes, because nothing can just be nice, Red and friends later discover that the world inhabited by these anime dogs and cats was Earth all along, but that Earth got destroyed in a scramble for powerful new resources that plunged humanity into a horrifying war. Here's what's nuts though. In this dystopia, it's not even the war that wipes us out. No, 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 that would be the decision made in the midst of this terrible war to hit the reset button on humanity, wiping out all life and lifting some land masses into the sky upon which new forms of life could thrive. New forms of life like, you know, anime dogs. Uh, Boston Dynamics, can I assume you're writing all this down? <laughs> Pinata is a container, often papier-mâché, that is decorated to look like an animal or object and filled with candy. And that, I think, is all the defining features of a pinata. Or at least, if you were playing a game that was all about raising a garden filled with living pinatas, you would hope that that's all there is to it, right? Because that's what the Viva Pinata series is all about. Raising these cute, pun-named critters up, keeping them healthy and happy, and ensuring their needs are met, whether that be keeping them away from pinatas who might hurt them, <coughs> or giving them the opportunity to find a mate with whom to practice a romantic dance. <coughs> oh, those two finally got together! But as you might have guessed, Viva Piñata does have a dark side, as Vanity Volpix recalls. Viva Piñata! I loved that game as a child. You can create a beautiful garden for colourful, papery piñata critters. You are given tasks to make them super happy and fill them to their maximum candiosity, or in other words, make them love you and life. Then you send them to a kids' party, where they are then smashed open. Oh yeah, that's the thing we forgot about piñatas. The bit where they're ritualistically smashed apart at parties and their innards feasted upon. Which is exactly where they're headed if we want to fulfil this order for Langston Lickertoad, himself a piñata, but one who requests his own kind crated up to be fired out of a cannon. Congratulations! Congratulations! You're complicit in piñata murder! Grim. And that's even before we look into the fact that Dostardos, the frightening masked entity that hunts down and smashes your sick piñatas, is very likely the missing son of the friendly dude who upgrades your shovel, corrupted by consuming sour candy, and it's probably time to stop digging into Fever Piñata lore. Because if this video has taught us anything, it's not to dig into the lore. <laughs> Few things in games, nay, in life, produce as much joy as Pokemon. In fact, the joy that this picture of a Charmander is generating is what's currently powering the studio. We call it Squee-Newable Energy. No, we don't. For the single human out there who doesn't know, Pokemon is an RPG series in which you travel through a world inhabited by curious and powerful creatures, trying to become the best Pokemon trainer of them all. This tried and tested formula has made Pokemon one of the most profitable game series in history, and like so much in life, is 100% more enjoyable when you don't think about it too hard. But oh no, several of you thought about it too hard, including ironic Dutch Moonshade when they said, 
What about 10-year-old kids making money with dogfights between, among others, giant spear bees, giant cannon turtles, and camels with volcanoes on their back? Face it, the Pokemon world should look more like the world of Fallout. Alright, fair enough, keeping creatures trapped inside Pokeballs and only letting them out to fight tooth and claw with other animals doesn't exactly sound ethical. But Pokemon enjoy battling, don't they? I mean, who wouldn't enjoy being electrocuted until they faint just to advance the career of some random child they bumped into in a field one day and who now owns them for all time? It's not our fault. If Pokemon don't like being caught, then the game should give you some kind of clue, like making it so that they resist capture, and you can only get them after first beating them nearly unconscious. Oh. Oh. Okay, the world of Pokemon is clearly a dystopia for the creatures who inhabit it, but there's some weird stuff going on with the humans too. Most regions appear to be run by mega corporations, who often are involved in sinister experiments to do with energy and Pokemon. Seriously, who's in charge here? There doesn't seem to be a government, but there is an army? Well, we know there was a war because Lieutenant Surge fought in it and says electric Pokemon saved his life in it when they electrocuted his enemies into paralysis. One theory posits the war is in fact still raging, which might explain the oddly depopulated cities and weird lack of adults in the Pokemon universe. But, oh crap, the joy engine ran dry. <sighs> Back to fossil fuels. Oh, oh, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, Luke, that's it, that's we're it. Back. Yeah, we're back. Keep, keep running in that wheel. Okay. Yeah, just think of all the like the the, the calories and things you're going to be burning off. That uh, new New Year's get get your core strength up. Okay. That's the most important thing. You'd better do this outro quick, Alan. Okay. Uh, well, those are some of the uh, cute things that are actually secretly nightmare dystopias. So, so dark, video games are so dark. Uh, unlike this room, which is nice and bright. Thanks, Luke. You're welcome. Um, thanks for watching this video. If you would like to see some more from us, uh, we've got some here. Um, here are puzzles in every game uh, from Outside Extra and over on Outside Xbox. Here are the unbeatable boss fights that you can actually beat. You're like, you, you can do it, Luke. Yeah, no, just wrap it, wrap it up. Subscribe, bye, and comments, bye. Ugh. <sighs>